uh, I have a question for James. So now that you have been in the business for one and a half years, what is this that one learning that you would like to share uh, with like budding entrepreneurs or people who want to enter into food and beverage business? Because when you started one and a half year back, definitely you must have did your own research and homework to enter into this specific niche area, uh, keeping in mind all the competition out there. So what is that one learning that you want to share that you think that can really help someone who really who want to launch a food and beverage business? There's, there's so many lessons, uh, I think. That is one, a one lesson that, that can really... No, yeah, there's, there's, so, there's so many, but I think, I think the one that I've learned is, I, I'm going to speak towards the product. Um, yeah. Something that my co-founders, Zachary, and I kind of set out to do was create a product that was going to disrupt a mm. tired segment. And the tired segment was... Um, the energy shop market, which is owned 99% by five hour energy. Um, mm, I don't yes, want to, yeah. I don't, I don't want to trash five hour energy too much, but it's an old product mm -hmm. that doesn't really understand the new consumer mm. and that was never consumed for the quality um, or the natural ingredients that it had inside of it, nor the taste. And so we, we looked at the market as this will be easy to disrupt. Mm. Um, and so we launched with this idea and to speak to packaging and just kind of wrap all of this up in, in, um, to, one, to one teaching. And in terms of packaging, we decided that, well, another thing that we don't like about Five Allergy is the small mouth on the shot mm. and the mm. fact that it's plastic. So... Yeah. We searched high and low for a co-packer that mm. could fill glass 3.4 ounce bottles. And those are only sold in Korea and Southeast Asia. If you've ever been over to Southeast Asia and yeah. seen drinks, that's how they're sold. They're sold in these glass, beautiful glass bottles, brown glass bottles. Yeah. And so that, that was the direction we went. And uh, it got very, very complicated very quickly having um, ingredients coming from Nigeria, mm -hmm. ingredients coming from the U.S., going to Korea, getting packaged in this glass bottle, and then getting very heavy, getting shipped back to the U.S., and then um, some logistical um, issues with shipping glass bottles and yeah. then breaking on their way to consumers, so having to pay extra for packaging. I think that the, where I'm going is the teaching is when you're, when you're producing a pilot and you're producing um, sort of an MVP, if you will, a minimum viable product is to, to do that, to, to yeah. keep it simple. Um, I grew up learning the phrase, keep it simple, stupid, yeah. um, kiss. And I, I would say to anyone who's starting out and who's trying to develop a product, yeah. um, really finding that MVP and finding something that, um, will will serve the core of your business function um, mm -hmm. is is the most important thing I've learned. Well, I absolutely. I think you you nailed it. I think um, MVP really really can help you in scaling up. I mean, that's the one piece of uh, interesting piece that I also noticed in so many big businesses when they launch, they start very small and they kind of innovate it. When they're very at an early stage, um, I was like, while looking at McDonald's, how McDonald's scaled up. I mean, they have a phenomenal story of how they started and how uh, particular they were uh, in the way the burger can come out when someone order it, and that really helped them. I think, and especially in your business where you have a very unique ingredient that uh, so supply chain issues, a lot of uh, challenges you might have faced, but I think. This MVP thing you really, I think, kind of touched upon can really, really play an important role for any business if they want to get into a food and beverage industry. Absolutely. Uh, having said that, uh, Robert, uh, what, is, what is an advice if you think, let's say, from, uh, from a macro point uh, as, as a leader in this packaging industry, uh, what is the one advice that you would like to give 
uh, to the food and beverage businesses or entrepreneurs who are venturing into it, or what are the things that they should keep in mind uh, for in general. And at the same time, if, if it's like the packaging, what, what kind of things they should look, keep tab on uh, at every stage, right? From the production stage till the end, end consumer. Yeah. So for me, it's really simple. It's, uh, are you solving a problem? Mm-hmm. Um, what's the need? And can yeah. you clearly identify the need? Yeah. And who are the customers that mm-hmm. will buy that need, right? Mm-hmm. And then who are the, who is the competition in this space? Yeah. What do they do well? And what yeah. do they not do well? Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, are you helping the ecosystem be mm-hmm. a better place? So for us at Enelflex, it's really about the food and beverage companies being better, being mm-hmm. better to the, being a steward of their products, ensuring quality and safety through distribution. Mm-hmm. For the OEMs, it's to understand the CPGs yeah. and what their goals are. So the gap and the white space is the communication and collaboration. It's not the technical. Yeah. It's not the scientists that make the product. It's not the R&D facilities. It's really connecting the dots. And I think you have to have a passion and burn for an end goal. Mm-hmm. And for Enoflex, and the reason why I retired early from Nestle USA to start this company a year ago was mm-hmm. because uh, globally, there is uh, some trillion dollars worth of capital investment in equipment globally, yeah. and more than $7 billion annually and rework. And that's too much money to throw away. So Mm -hmm. that means there's opportunity to be better. Uh, At the same time, uh, used equipment that's purchased globally is somewhat in the double digits and billions. And there's a three or 4% of annual loss in just waste rework. And I experienced it. So I came out of an environment where I saw globally, we have a systemic problem, very smart people globally, Mm -hmm. but the, the, the tools and the processes don't connect all the way. Right. And we have demographics and age groups that are retiring. Yeah. And so that tribal knowledge being captured and transmitted across both uh, OEMs and food and beverage companies, mm-hmm. there is a gap. So my pa- passion is when companies win, get food on shelf, and yeah. stop the waste and rework and allow innovation and, and, and uh, renovation of products. I'm a firm believer in uh, opportunity to try something new yeah. And to be able to give that company the opportunity to do it by freeing up some, some of the wasted opportunity. So the answer your question real simply, you have to know what the white space is, yeah. what's the opportunity, what problem you're trying to solve, and then go after it and get a lot of coaching. Get yeah. a lot of people around you that can help offset what you don't know. Mm-hmm. My background is an engineer, not marketing, not sales, but yeah. to surround myself with people and learn, 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 learn. Absolutely. Well, that's excellent. I think uh, that, that is that, because there's a learning curve for every business and for every brand. And I think with the right stakeholders in place uh, and they can get to know a lot. I think it's all about connecting the dots in the right direction, which can have a great, uh, a small idea that can scale up and become very, very big in the long run. Uh, before we wrap up uh, today's panel discussion, uh, I have one more final question for all of you. And uh, uh, someone who has already launched a business. So Molly has a very great roadmap for her business. So as an entrepreneur, uh, Molly, what do you think uh, how a brand should, where the brand should focus their attention? Definitely product is that one important pillar. But after the product, what is, where should a brand pay their most attention to? And uh, how do you think uh, when they are smaller, like when they are medium size, uh, should they get? Should they have all of their marketing done internally, or should they kind of do it with the help of agencies or experts? Well, what are your thoughts on it? Um, so I feel like for me, entrepreneurship and sort of growing a business to wherever you take it is about perseverance, and there's it's a marathon. There's no one decision that's right or wrong. It's a million small decisions made and getting up and doing the work and years of hard work and a commitment to that. So you really have to kind of be proud of what you're doing and enjoy the journey. Um, Cause that's really it, you know, um, 
in terms of where you focus after product, obviously having a product and, and, and packaging that's engaging and a voice that resonates on the front end is important, but it's a brand is a live entity. It's not, you're done, you know, put that in a box. It's you're constantly tweaking and adjusting and listening to feedback and growing and learning and expanding into product categories. And I think for me, the success there is engagement with your consumer base, you know, and we talked a lot today about sort of tribe. And I think um, finding out who your consumer base is and yeah. having a dialogue with them that's active and seeking their feedback and listening to their feedback. And, and when you get customer requests, recording them and, and, um, and, and acting on it so you can grow with your customers as they grow into new interests, tastes, you know, food trends, whatever. Um, in terms of marketing, I'm, I'm a firm believer in sort of the businesses I lead of keeping your core team really lean mm -hmm. and having a team of just like top performing A game players mm -hmm. and bringing in third party experts to sort of help where it is needed. So we have a director of marketing um, who actually in my case with Red Clay is a very talented graphic designer. With Baby Eaters, she was more strategic. Mm -hmm. And so we would, in, we would hire, a you know, really talented graphic design work for baby eaters, but with red clay, she can do that, but we bring in great photography or we bring in a digital ads team to sort of make, you know, get those ads into the world or a PR team to help us with influencer strategy. And so um, you can dial up and dial down the vendors based on your budget and seasonality, but sticking with that kind of core, core, core roles, we've got a director of customer service, of marketing, of sales, um, we actually wholesale and then direct to consumer sales. We have two people for two, two sides of the business. But um, I think bigger picture is, you know, starting with that beautiful product, but being open to pivot and grow and change with yeah. your consumer base um, and listening and, and having it really be an interaction. Wow. Excellent advice there, Molly. Thank you. Uh, James, what are your thoughts on this particular point or question. Well, I, I just think Molly makes a great point and it's something that we learned and something that I, I touched on with my with my kiss last night and keep it simple, stupid. It just what what we were able to do is realize very quickly that we weren't going to disrupt five hour energy because our consumer was very different than five hour energy. And it it seems like it should have been very apparent, but I uh, I think when you're starting a business, we, you know, we felt like we'd done our homework, but you can never know until you know. And so that's kind of what Molly's talking about is just that flexibility and that willing, willingness to pivot and um, willingness to, to wake up every morning and be ready to just be knocked back down, um, I think is, is really important. And so that's actually something that we've done with Bissy now and that we've been really fortunate actually in this time to, to have been allowed to do with Bissy, which is to move away from this kind of more complicated supply chain um, and to get more at the core of our business. So launching the single origin powder directly from Nigeria. And that that's coming from a lot of consumer feedback about interest in the actual raw ingredient and kind of being fed up with an addiction to a coffee or not being able to find a good alternative. And, and then in addition to the folks who are actually consuming the um, energy drink itself on a regular basis, some of those evangelists that I talked about earlier, a lot of their feedback was on wanting more of it because it tastes really good. And that was a huge focus for us. It was making sure that the product tasted better than any other energy drink on the market. And we accomplished that. And, and so now what we're getting are people wanting 12 ounces of it, not 3.4 ounces of it. So we're also releasing a, a, a 12 ounce form. And then more feedback we got um, was on a carbonated drink. So we're also releasing some carbonated SKUs and really kind of hitting the market with this um, for product um, arsenal, I guess. And, and that's all really based off of this customer feedback that we've had the privilege of receiving. So. Wow, that's excellent advice that you have shared there, James. Thank you.